Hi, I, ca I can't believe that you guys are here. I can't believe I'm here. Oh my God. I can't believe I'm here without a mask, but we're all vaccinated, just so you know. So um, yeah, I wanted to just start off by um, telling you guys a little bit about this program. Um, first of all, I really wanted to uh, thank Lincoln Center, to thank John Nakagawa um, for giving me this space uh, to curate this program. Um, so when the date came up for this uh, program, I was really conscious, I think we were all conscious that May is AAPI month, Asian American Pacific Islander month, and that specifically today is the one year anniversary of the murder of George Floyd. And I often think about a quote by the historian Robin Kelly, where he says, how do we dream ourselves out of this nightmare? And for me, it's really about reflecting on how to make inhumanity humane. How do we return to humanity? And um, the more I thought about it was that there has to be space for us to speak, to be heard. And I'm especially grateful uh, to Lincoln Center and, and John Nakagawa and Un Lee because they're actually making space for me by giving me this opportunity to curate this program. And when I thought about it even more, I realized that oftentimes we do have conversations about race and about gender, but oftentimes we do not hear from women of color. And so I invited this wonderful group of, of people together. Um, Cindy Tran, I heard her read a poem at the Peace Vigil uh, that was organized by the Asian American Foundation, uh, which happened after the Georgia shootings, in which six women of Asian ethnicity were killed. And when she and I spoke, Neither of us had slept for that entire week. Part of it was disturbing as well because one of the women who, were who was killed actually has my mother's name and is around the same age as my mom. And all I was hearing at that time was the narrative of the killer and we weren't hearing from the women. We didn't hear about the women at first. Right, so um, I invited her to take part in this program because I wanted to hear her story. And I also invited uh, Simone White. I had heard her um, at a poetry reading, actually, with uh, Terrence Hayes. And he actually did write a poem about um, the murder of George Floyd. But I was even more drawn to Simone's writing because she really does address this invisibility of women of color. And so I understand that perhaps some of the poems are quite honest and direct, but I hope you also understand that we as women of color, we have to live like this all the time. Uh, we don't have the opportunity to listen and just observe for one hour, right? So we don't get an hour off. And what I really wanted to put together was a program about truth and honesty um, and to make space for all of us, women of color, people of color. And um, again, I do wanna thank um, Lincoln Center because they made this space for me to create and curate this program. And that's been the mission of my entire life 
is to make space for others. So it feels especially meaningful um, when I'm given that space to create. So thank you so much. Um, also, um, Vijay Iyer uh, is joining me here, and I know that he has the same beliefs, aside from being a great artist. Um, he also believes in the same beliefs of, of bringing forward and advocating for and making space to hear the stories and voices of women and people of color. Okay, but a little more about the specifics of the program. Um, the first uh, three pieces in the program uh, are part of this larger initiative called Alone Together that was begun at the very beginning of the pandemic last year. Um, and I created it uh, in order to help my fellow freelancers because just like it's a miracle that you guys are all here, um, we obviously haven't had work for um, the majority of the year in the pandemic. So I wanted to find a way uh, to help them through commissions. And I was able to do this uh, through my nonprofit, ARCO Collaborative. And so this is a continuation of that project um, of helping younger freelance musicians. Um, I'm opening with a piece by Courtney Bryan, and it's called Island Baby Reflections. And if there are any Korean Americans in the audience, you'll, rec you'll recognize this song. Um, it's a lullaby uh, that was written actually after the Korean War and is about uh, kind of the separation of family members um, as a result of the war. The second uh, piece is by Latasha Bundy, and her mentor was Courtney, and talking a lot about space, she wrote this piece. The title of the piece is called Something Something Space. So the thing that we need is space. The third work is by Amadeus Julian Regucera, and he is the mentee and the recommended composer from, uh, by Ken Ueno, who's written the piece Better Angels. And um, Amadeus's work deals with the fragility and fraughtness of this past year in terms of not only reflecting upon the fragility of life, but all of these conversations we seem to be more open to having. Um, in, in uh, this time period about race. Uh, so that piece is called While, While You Were Away. And um, yes, oh, oh, I was supposed to say something. Thank you to our American Sign Language interpreters for making tonight's program accessible. Thank you. <laughs>
Here's um, the wonderful Cindy Tran. True American sentences. One. He looks at my name tag and asks, what's your real name? I tell him, that Cindy is what's printed on my birth certificate. What's your middle name? My. I knew it was in there somewhere. Two. On Franklin Avenue, he bumps into me and says, watch where you're going. Three. I stand at a bus stop, and an old man turns to me. I fought in Nam. You're here because of me. Four. On Grand, he bumps into me and shoves me to the side. Five. In an Ikea parking lot, I yield. He signals me to roll down the window of my U-Haul truck, laughs, not too bad for an Asian woman, and speeds away. Six. On University Avenue, he bumps into me and says, you're in my way. Seven. In his office, I hear my therapist call me beautiful and call himself colorblind. He says my anger at him is really anger at my parents. He calls this transference. Eight. On Broadway, he bumps into me and says, didn't see you. Nine, my friend has brain cancer and enrolls in a clinical trial. He asks if I would sleep with him before he dies. When I say no, he asks if I have any Asian friends who could help him. 10, on 59th, he bumps into me and says, bitch. 11, a friend lends money to help me move to college. Halfway through paying him back, he says he can't help but feel like I owe him something else. Twelve. My mentor encourages me to embrace my youth and pursue writing. After I turned 21, he asks if he could take nude photos of me. Thirteen. I stand in the aisle at the end of a Delta flight. There's no room in front of me. There's no room behind me. A man gets up and discovers room above my shoulder for his elbow, room in front of my ribcage for his carry-on, and room above my toes for his Oxford. I say, ouch. He says, well, excuse me. 14. No is a miracle word that cured him of his brain cancer and kept saving my life. 15. Last week, I heard a woman say, I will only ever be someone's first Asian girlfriend, and I felt power. 16. Every time a white man went out of my life, my life got better. 17. Every time a friend stands up for herself, I feel her power bring me back to life.
This piece is called Or W W. My name is Jane. My job is devoted to diversity. The incident is a private event. Our strict rules against conflict were not working that evening. I was busy preparing my intention. I am not responsible for my mouth, of course, meaning, of course, these words were dropped into a situation. I problem solve distress. My apology caused myself to be free. Of course, I am very very quiet. In the quiet, my motivations matter. My weeping wanted my defense. Conflict bonds me to nothing. I love home. I love reading. I love benefits from community, funders, and diversity.
decide that far in advance. But what I decided is that I'm going to do two short pieces of mine as a medley. One is called Children of Flint, and the other is called Combat Breathing. And I want to dedicate this performance to the children of Flint and to George Floyd and his family and to victims of police and state violence and racism and oppression all over the world. Thank you.
These are two sections from a long poem called Or on Being the Other Woman. Monitoring a stink bug's progress or beautiful random application of remorseless violence. There, my boy has begun to apprehend such concepts as affection, better identified as interested longing. Does this one like me? Maybe he doesn't like me. Look, the bug. Windy, undifferentiated consonants, unsorted words please me so. One day I will tell how much time was there before he could evoke in me anything like interest. His thought interests me. I date from discussion of the need to use a pot or toilet for shit. In a few days, I would fall into a rage on the street arguing with my mother on the telephone. What makes me if her desire vibrates as pleading packed in insult? In my guise as woman, work and insomnia rumble through. They are girders, money worries, girding my whole body, such job interviews, saying intolerable kinds of nothing about how all of it came to pass. Is this about money? My inability to pass into the moneyed upper middle class to which I had been raised, projected. One thinks one has refused. I really hate liberals. I do not like to hear the troubles of middle class persons fussing about their children's use of cell phones. What if I misdirect or misuse what I now know about the feminine crucible? My boy inquires about my anger, somehow knows it is for, against something, not him at all, just wants to know what. You don't like Eli? No, no, I like him. I'm sorry. Mostly, I have been able to decide what aspects of my own potency my child will witness. When I break ties with men or refuse to keep with the tradition of fungibility, insofar as my action is a lump of mass action or it is insanity, such as to choose to act precisely in emotional ways. The emotions are the cortex of reason. Then my heart tells me the way as there is no way. My boy and I rely on media to keep me strong enough to love. No man has ever not tried to steal from me. That's wrong. The man who never tried to steal from me never wanted to be with me like that, while the man I was with who explicitly stole from me was so crazy at the time I didn't think much of it, structurally. Or I could not think structurally at the time. In California, prairie light and scenes from Midwinter Day were coming to me in a confused way via social media. I wrote to Laura, I had a dream in which I was overcome or beset by a kind of erotic storm encircled by lovers, that is, men of whom I would say fucking is eternally in the nature of our bond. The transmutational properties of masculinity, the three forcefully whipping around me, having become a cosmos of presence to myself, my mesis with no share of the bearing down. Inside their fucking gyre, I transmitted a signal for help, but it could not escape because the force of the dimensions which they were or were creating was a black hole. The real blackness of the whole was true. I woke up knowing what words to say. Say the dream, Laura. Within two or three days, I had been trying to identify the name of the pressures. No, I cannot remember what any of them had done to me. I try to remember forming an intention. Now I am going to act as crazy as possible and threaten to go to his job and tell his mama and his best friend what kind of person he is and how he's been stealing from me all these years and telling people I'm a spoiled bitch because I have all these degrees and won't take my baby out of private preschool. So I was acting crazy and smoking out the window of my house, 
screaming into the garden at the morning doves, looking at me like I was crazy. I stopped when he said a number, I guess. I can't remember much about it because I got pretty drunk afterward and woke up in the night thinking, Lord, I am not able to do this much longer. Please let this man see my humanity. In two or three days also, I had learned there was no name for the pressures. It was the most ordinary black womanhood, which is not nameless, has all the names of us, and is nameless, and has no intention, and is strategic. One of the days, a young dancer came up to me and said, I don't know how to embody the musical problems. And I said, well, how does it make you feel? I began to speak of it myself when I felt myself growing more graphically male through its practice. I listened at deafening loudness in my car. Clearly, I am trying to hurt myself. The words they say, they have a newness. I promise never to speak the words in my poems, not in defiance of interpretation, but because they are so creepily hostile and unfunny. The interior they assume in a dress so murderous, I don't see the point of repeating them. This is what words do. How does it make you feel? You are not allowed to have feelings. You are not allowed to have anything. And when you have something, somebody will try to take it from you. Don't doubt it for a second. There is no honor in patriarchy. It is a drug. Sometimes I allow my eyes to roll back in its vicious pleasure. I can feel joy if I remember I am feeling the power of myself as a vacuous thing, an unknown thing, out of which words come under pressure, begin to make new, so that the structure of the poem was falling down around me, as were the constitutive energies of what I was, such as they were visible or detectable to me. I sensed them breaking. They were already broken. This was the condition of which the poem must consist, the radiant materiality of circuitous attacks, some such as might be deflected, others helplessly slip inside what is. Um, I realize that there is not a printed program, so I just wanted to let you know uh, that the final piece, solo piece that I played was called Better Angels by Ken Ueno. Um, and <laughs> our next piece is called The Diamond. It was written by Mr. Iyer here, uh, and it's based on the Diamond Sutra.
having a technical thing. Okay. So we restart. <laughs> Thank you. 